Damon Fordham, professor of history at Virginia College in Charleston, as well as an author and historian. This week, the first week of December of 2015, as I say this, marks the 60th anniversary of what's probably the most famous story in black American history. It was on December the 1st, 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, where Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the to give her seat up on the Cleveland Avenue bus in Montgomery, Alabama, which of course led to the great bus boycott of 1955. And on December the 5th, 1955, Martin Luther King gave this great speech at Holt Street Baptist Church in that city, saying that there comes a time when people are trampled, tired of being trampled by the feet of oppression and so forth. Well, everybody knows that story. But here's something that you may not have known. Rosa Parks was not the first lady in Montgomery, Alabama to give up her seat or to refuse to go to the back of the bus. That honor belongs to a lady by the name of Claudette Colvin. Wait a minute, hold up, you might be saying. Wait a minute, hold up. How come I never heard about this? Nobody told me this before. Well, you're about to hear about it now. And here's that story. Claudette Colvin was born in Birmingham, Alabama, on September the 5th, 1939. And she was a very inquisitive type child. She grew up in deep poverty. Her mother was forced to give her to her grand aunt and grand uncle to raise, and they eventually moved to Montgomery, where she went to Booker T. Washington High School. And she lived in a part of Birmingham, excuse me, of Montgomery called King Hill, which was at that time the ghetto section of Montgomery. Now, and she also attended the Huntington Street Baptist Church, which was more or less a low-income type church. And plus, she was dark-skinned at a time when that was e even more so of uh, an issue in the black community than it is now. I mean, it's still an issue, but it was even more so of one back then. So, but with all of these strikes, she was very intelligent, very well-read, always asked questions. She resented the whole color cast thing and the whole cl caste class thing, class cast thing in the black community. And of course she resented the racial restrictions that were forced upon her at that time. She asked questions that many adults were afraid to answer or were embarrassed because of their lack of articulation to answer. But then, when she was at Booker T. Washington High School, she found a mentor in her teacher who was a lady by the name of Miss Geraldine Nesbitt. Uh, let me see if I can get this shot in here. Uh, that's her in the middle. It's Geraldine Nesbitt. And Geraldine Nesbitt taught her to be proud of who she was, taught her black history, along with another teacher at that school, a lady by the name of Miss Josie Lawrence. They taught her about Africa, they taught her about Harriet Tubman, and a lot of things the school books did not teach. And they also taught her about her constitutional rights as a citizen of the United States of America that were not enforced in Alabama at that time. Well, all of this reached its climax on March the 2nd, 1955. She got, she got on uh, the Highland Gardens bus in uh, Montgomery that day. And, you know, she, got, she sat uh, roughly in the uh, middle of the bus. However, as she was on the bus, unfortunately, they, forced her, they tried to force her to move to the back because a white person wanted to sit down, and she refused. Not only did she refuse, but she also fought the policemen when they tried to take her off the bus, saying that she had her constitutional right to sit where she pleased under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, which forbids, which forbids discrimination of citizens based on race, color, or national origin. A lot of people didn't know about that in those days. So, she was taken to jail. And many people thought, hey, wait a minute, we can make a test case out of this. So the local NAACP and uh, an organization in Montgomery that was called the uh, Women's Political Council all got together and thought, hey, maybe we could, uh, you know, make a test case out of this to perhaps put an end, so, end segregation. But then the Women's Political Council, you have to understand, they and the NAACP consisted mostly of the elite and educated class of black people in Montgomery, Alabama at that time. And so once they decided to focus on the Claudette Colvin case, which made headlines in Jet Magazine and she started getting fan mail from across the country, they started wondering, hey, wait a minute, 
Who is this girl? Maybe she is not one of our set, you know. They found out that, of course, her great aunt and uncle were not part of the set that attended Dexter Avenue Baptist Church or Alla or on the faculty of Alabama State College or members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and other such groups. And so they were like, well, we don't know about this. And oh, then they found out she lived in King Hill. Uh-oh. And of course, that was shorthand in Montgomery for ghetto, the hood. Oh, no, we can't have that. Ew, ew, we can't use such a person. So they decided to pass on her until somebody more fitting of their concept, who they thought was more sympathetic, would come along. E.D. Nixon, who was of the Montgomery Improvement Association, said, I had to be sure I could have somebody I could win with. And so they chose not to go along with Claudette Colvin in her situation. Then to make matters worse, sometime after this, Claudette uh, became the object of affection of a local married man and they went out, and two went out, and three came back. Now, in those days, when you were had a child out of when you had a child out of wedlock, that was a big shame and scandal. And of course, people tended to look down on women in that situation in those days. And you know, being the son of a lady who was who had to put me up for adoption because of that very situation in those days, and uh, some nine years later in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I get that. And this was, of course, a tragedy all the way around. She eventually had this son and was, uh, and eventually moved on to New York. Where, and it was just a tragic situation all the way around. But before she left for New York, though, something very important happened. She testified in the case regarding bus segregation in Montgomery. And after and after the more famous case that got, was involved with this, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute, she got up and testified about what she did in court. Now, they tried to use her to incriminate Martin Luther King of leading the boycott. And the, and the, and the lawyer kept saying, well, who represented you? Who led you? And she replied, 15, mind you. She, she says this. Quite naturally, we are not going to have any ignorant person to lead us. We had to have someone who was strong enough to speak up, someone who knows the law. It is quite natural that we are not going to get up there ourselves when some of us can't even read or write. But we knew when we were treated wrong. And they tried to get her to say that Martin Luther King had coerced them to do that. But she would not budge. And finally the lawyer said, why did you stop riding the buses on December the 5th? And she said, because we were treated wrong, dirty, and nasty. Hey. They couldn't deal with all of that. Well, get this. They won the case, but the case was appealed. To the, but the case was appealed by Alabama until several months later, and, you know, they ruled, of course, in favor of the blacks after that. So, after they passed on Claudette Colvin, they, they, after, they, some months after this, another lady refused to get off of the bus, a young lady by the name of Mary Smith, but they passed on her because she was not of that set, of course. But on December the 1st, 1955, a, a lady who happened to be Claudette Colvin's mother's very good friend, who was the secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Rosa Parks. And you know the rest of that story. Yeah, in fact, Rosa Parks had known Claudette Colvin quite well. So Rosa Parks made history. Claudette Colvin did now, having said that, don't get this twisted. Claudette Cole, I mean, Rosa Parks did go through a lot of hard sacrifices that are not known to the general public after she made her stand. So this isn't about taking anything away from her. But the fact of the matter was, due to reasons of class and so forth, Claudette Colvin was denied her place in history. In fact, she said on November the 28th, 2005, in an interview, that part of the reason that she was not chosen was because of class and her complexion at that time, and of course the perception of people who lived in King Hill. Well, her story was ignored for years. Then on November the 28th, 1995, the uh, USA Today did a story about her. And I was at the time right as a journalist for the Charleston Coastal Times, and I wrote about a story about all of this for the 
December 27, 1995 issue of that newspaper. Well, long story short, she said that no black author came to tell, or to tell her story, but this guy named Philip Hoos wrote about her in this book, uh, Claudette Colvin, Twice Toward Justice, which spoke of her heroics. And she only had one good thing to say about one of the leaders in Montgomery at that time. She said that after she did that testimony before the court in Montgomery, hardly anybody came to congratulate her, but then Reverend uh, Ralph Abernathy invited her to come to this party they were having at, the church, at his church where they were serving ice cream. Well, she served ice cream to one preacher who got up and said, that was a brave and courageous thing that you did, and I really appreciate that. And she was just glowing over that. Guess who that was? Martin Luther King who at that time was only 11 years older than her. He was the one leader who she had anything good to say about that and that whole proceedings. Now, Claudette Colvin today is fairly well known because of uh, this book that's out, and she goes around to schools talking about her experiences, but, not, but there's one thing I want you to get from all of this. I didn't do all of this to say, oh, look at what those terrible middle-class people did to Claudette Colvin and all that. Look, hold on. I don't, I don't deal with the gloom, despair, and agony of me stuff. My, my, the point of this is not only to correct the historical record while giving Rosa Parks her just due, but to, uh, to understand this. Whether you are born in the so-called ghetto, whether you're considered upper class or lower class, whether you are articulate or inarticulate, whether you are male or female, you, as a human being of sound mind, no matter who you are, you can stand up and play your part in history. And as long as you keep talking about it, somebody's going to listen. But if you say nothing, no one will. This is Damon Ford.